to the public. January 1, do we have any apologies? Any apologies? The deputy chair indicated he would be late. Okay, okay. We want to agenda item two, chairperson's business. Can advise members that the clerk and I will be attending the voluntary and community sector uh, or departmental group meeting organised by NICVA in Kirchtown on the 11th of March 2016. I have invited to address the group in my capacity chairperson. I intend to provide an overview of the committee's work throughout the mandate by discussing our le- legacy report, which will hopefully have been approved by the committee at that stage. Item 3, minutes of the meeting, 9th of February 2016. Your prime members to draft minutes of the meeting <coughs> on the 9th of February 2016 at pages 7 to 12. Are members content with the draft minutes of record? OK, members. So I will sign. <coughs> we want to agenda item 4, moderate. Can you refer members to monitor rising at pages 16 to 21? I advise members that the Rivers Agency wish to inform the committee that they intend to invite those affected by recent flooding to give an account of their experience uh, to the review at the open meeting on the 16th of March. Details are not yet forthcoming, but further information will be made available to the committee as soon as possible. Are members content to action the rest of the matters arising as suggested on the index sheet at pages 14 to 15? Great. Okay, members. <coughs> we want item five. Um, uh, our briefing to our fisheries bill position on amendments. As members may recall, at our meeting the 26th of January 2016, the committee agreed that clause one to five and seven to eighteen not stand part of the bill. The committee also agreed the report on the fisheries bill at the following week's meeting. I can confirm that the notices of intent were tabled with the Bill Office last Thursday, the 11th of February 2016. Can I refer members to papers provided by the Department at pages 23 to 26? This correspondence indicates that the Minister has tabled the amendments. Uh, the current notice of amendments is showing the notices of intent that clauses 5 and 7 to 18 not stand part of the Bill, in both the name of the Committee and the Minister. The Minister also has also tabled three draft amendments to Clause 6. Can I advise members that these three amendments are technical in nature? Uh, the con- consolidated version of the, the 1981 Fisheries Act in your pact at page 27-28. The draft technical amendments are shown in blue on page 28. However, I can remind members that the Committee's scrutiny of this bill has been completed and it will be up to members themselves to decide how they wish to vote on the technical amendments. The Lord official is available in the public gallery and can come to the table if any member has any questions. Does any member have any questions on the amendments? Okay, that's very good. All right, John, okay. Can I advise members that the consideration stage of the Fisheries Bill is uh, scheduled for Tuesday the 23rd of February 2016. The current indicative timing suggests that the debate will take place in the morning. If this changes, it will affect our committee meeting that afternoon. Oh. <coughs> Next week. Uh, and item six. <coughs> our briefing from the Lord inquiry into better regulation. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 30 to 34 and papers provided by the department at pages 35 to 58? Can I welcome uh, Paul McGurgan, uh, Central Services Information Systems, <coughs> Pauline Rooney, head of the Area Based Schemes Division? Uh, we have Dara Watson, review of decisions, and John McCollum, Animal Identification, Legislation and Welfare. You're all very welcome. I'm just asked you to stick up to. Ten minutes or so, one up or two type beast, but okay, to give your presentation. Okay. Thank you for your welcome. Uh, in conducting the inquiry into better regulation, the committee has asked for clarification on a number of issues related to Dodd's approach to reducing the regulatory burden on the farming community. And in particular, the recommendations concerned with the agri food better regulation and simplification review. In addition, the committee had posed a number of questions to the department on two research papers. 
presented by your researcher. One was about uh, cross-compliance and inspection processes, and the second was in relation to large review of decisions and appeals procedures. We have provided the committee with a detailed written brief addressing each of these areas, and I'm joined this afternoon by Pauline Rooney, who is head of uh, EU area-based schemes, Dara Watson, service delivery, and Joan McConnell from Animal Policy, and we'll be happy to address any further questions you may have. Perhaps by way of introduction to our discussion, I could make one or two general points. I'm sure you will agree that efficient and effective regulation is essential to support business growth, but is equally important also to protect our citizens and the environment. A well-regulated industry is vital in underpinning trade, and increasingly is the strength that the Northern Ireland agri-food industry is exploiting in securing new market export opportunities. I would want uh, however, to make it clear that the Department does not set out to make things difficult for farmers. We take our responsibility seriously and have no interest in gold plating. If there are areas where we can relax the rules, we will. We use regulatory impact assessments as a key tool to ensure the principles of good regulation are applied. There is a proportionate effort applied to regulatory impact assessments, including economic appraisals, estimating the costs and benefits of options. I am aware, however, that the committee has concerns that there isn't currently external scrutiny of these assessments. The Deputy Minister, on behalf of the Executive commissioned a review of Business Red Tape, which published its report in November 2015. There are six main recommendations contained within the report, including uh, appointment of an independent better regulation champion and appointment of an independent scrutiny committee to provide opinion on departmental regulatory impact assessments. The response to the recommendations and associated action plan has now been drawn up and will be presented to the Executive for consideration and agreement. Since the completion of DARD's Better Regulation Action Plan in 2013, we have continued to make progress on reducing the administrative burden on farmers. Most notable is the achievement of official brucellosis free status. Animal disease control was identified as the most burdensome area for farmers in the initial large DOE better regulation review, and the securing of OBF status allows relaxation of controls, leading to savings in compliance costs for the primary production sector of approximately £7 million per annum, as well as £8 million savings for the taxpayer. The second example of progress relates to livestock identification, registration and movement which was identified as the second most burdensome area for farmers. An amendment to the EU regulation has entered force, allowing for electronic identification of cattle, or EID. The amendment to the regulation allows the keeper to decide on a voluntary basis to make use of a derogation from keeping an on-farm on holding register subject to certain conditions. This means keepers no longer have to maintain an on-farm herdbook to record births, deaths, movements of cattle, and can opt to rely on APIS instead. Another recommendation in the Better Regulation Report was to complete 80 per cent of land eligibility inspections by remote sensing using satellite imagery rather than on-farm inspections. During 2015, DORD completed 86 per cent of basic farm payment inspections using remote sensing, saving time for farmers. Challenges, however, remain. Cap reform illustrates some of the difficulties in further reducing the administrative burden on farmers. The Commission's proposals and regulatory framework are very complex to begin with when compared to the single farm payment system. Some progress was made in simplifying these, and we welcome recent announcements on further simplification. However, we still see an increase in administration, which is disappointing, and the challenge is to keep this to a minimum. But we are hopeful the better regulation programme, known as REFIT, which is committed to making EU law lighter, simpler and less costly, will in the future deliver benefits to citizens and businesses. We will relax the rules wherever we can, and the Minister has given a clear commitment to examine any specific areas of excessive administration burden which are brought to our attention. And we have a few examples of this recently, as the, the Committee will be aware. Finally, it is clear that for the rollout of enhanced digital services with appropriate support 
offers significant potential for farmers in reducing <coughs> the burden of compliance and increasing ease of access to simplified procedures. There are very real gains to be made by farmers who are willing to make the shift to online services. The forms can be pre-populated with information that we already hold. Data can be validated for submission, and human errors such as omissions can be instantly picked up so there will be less subsequent amendment and less cause for appeals, penalties and disallowances. And we are actively working towards the establishment of a digital support team at CAFRI that will provide assistance to farmers in making the switch to digital. In conclusion, Mr Chairman, I hope that has given the committee some insight into the better regulation and simplification agenda within the department. I'd like to reassure the committee that the Minister and the Department continue to see better regulation and the simplification of service delivery as strategically important, and we welcome the committee's support <coughs> and scrutiny in ensuring that is embedded in our policy and delivery work in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I noted that you said uh, that the Department had no interest in gold plating. Surely one clear example of gold plating was the single tagging issue where the department after two years of very stringent measures uh, this committee put some pressure on and you did look at other areas of the United Kingdom and you did accept that. We appreciate that you did accept that what you had uh, uh, put in place was uh, erroneous and uh, many of our eyes was totally uh, discriminatory actually. You can understand the perception that your department does go play things when we see that happen. I, I, on some occasions, I think that it could be a perception, yes. Uh, it's not an intention to set out to, to go play anything. There's an interpretation of the regulations. Uh, and in that particular situation, then we did address that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have talked to the committee before about this. Um, and yes, the, the, the threshold that was in. It was set in good faith by the people that were involved with it. I mean, they looked at what the guidance said was needed, um, and there were various words in it, and I can't remember what those words are off the top of my head. But that, but that, that it was an interpretation because, well, and at that stage, we actually did look, as, as we always do, to see what the other regions around us were doing to try and and and, and get gauge where we might go on it. But we have a responsibility to make sure that we don't end up with. This alliance, uh, and, and that's it's a balance. It's a balance, and yes, the balance was skewed in, in, a, in a stricter place than it should have been, and, and, and we have rectified that. Yeah, yeah and, we, and I think the full march is for doing that, and, you know. But uh, we felt, and many felt, uh, that that uh, when one looked at it, it certainly didn't stack up. So I mean, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, moving on to a review of decisions, the procedure. Um, as you know, we've been concerned about the length of time uh, that it can take for someone to, to get the repeal heard. And it would appear that all other jurisdictions do have some sort of a target or several standards for repeals. We have asked you to look at the, this, and you appear to be making a tentative step in putting targets for responding to application, applicants and targets for turnaround time on appeal cases. Uh, however, you have not committed to definite targets as yet. Can you explain why not? Um, when we might expect to see such targets? Yes, well, certainly I can say from the stage two point of view, we're very well aware that setting targets has, has a very positive effect um, for the farmers and certainly for our staff in terms of motivation as well. <coughs> um, we are looking to other jurisdictions to see the specific targets that they have set. In fact, there, there's a meeting um, with the Welsh and the English jurisdictions next week where we're going to take some of the, the recommendations that your report has actually indicated and we're going to discuss the, the impacts of those, how they've arrived at the targets they've set. Um, we were before you in September and I think at that time we said we, had, we were putting in place um, a revised process to try and tackle the backlog that we had at that time, and I'm, I am, although it's, it's going to be 12 to 18 months before we are aware of the effect that that has on turnarounds, I am in a position to say, however, that the, um, the number of cases that we have reached decision on since September is now 50, it's standing at 50, and we are well on our way to achieving the target that we set for the 2015-16 year, which was 100 cases. 
Um, so that's a significant improvement, uh, which is evidenced by, by the processes that we, the revised processes that we've put in place. <coughs> so we are certainly considering it, and we intend to to put um, revised processes, revise our processes even further. I mean, we are continuously improving what we do, and any ideas or, or suggestions that we can take from wherever to improve the efficiency of our process, we will do. Okay. Uh, have you any idea, uh, percentage-wise, we're bringing Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, a review, is there more dis re review of decisions in, do you know the percentage of, in each area? Or any idea, are we, are we a higher percentage or not than other regions of appeals per percent, percentage of, of our claims? could certainly find that out when I'm in uh, it would be interesting. the jurisdictions, yes, and we can, it would we can be bring that back to tell a story whether or not our departments gold plating some things too. Yeah. I, think, I think everybody has the opportunity to, to co to a review of decisions That's right. and, and it probably depends a lot on um, on the kind of decisions that are that, that are being made. For example, if you take it, we've got the active control, <coughs> control here in Northern Ireland, and that's to address a, a specific issue that we have here. Um, it doesn't exist to the same extent in, in, in other regions. So, um, so we'll, we'll certainly have people who, who are disappointed in that, who'll come through the review of decisions, um, which, which you may not see in any of the other regions. So I would imagine, actually, probably as you go into a new cap reform, um, every single time you probably get a, an increase because that's a brand new application into a new scheme, set of schemes, and you're likely to get decisions you know, that will peak, that people don't like um, and they want reviewed. And, uh, and so you'll, you'll get that probably peak every time you go through a cap reform cycle, I would imagine. Yeah, it'd just be interesting to know how we are higher percentage. Yeah. It just would be interesting. Okay, Joanne. Duff. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I thank you for your brief and, and declare an interest? My husband's a, a beef farmer. Um, like the Chair, I was frantically writing down and noting, Paul, your comments, no interest in gold plating, and if there are instances where we can relax, we will. I may quote those back to you at, at some point, because um, um, that, that's not the, the feeling out there among farmers. Um, I'm interested in the issue of the principle of earned recognition and understand that farmers in the Farm Quality Assurance Scheme are given positive waiting by DARD's service delivery group. So can you maybe explain this process for us, because this shows that DARD agree with the principle then of earned recognition. Can you take us through this process? Yeah. Um, so if, if, a, if, if a farmer is a member of a Farm Quality Assurance System Scheme, um, in, in terms of the, in terms of the, 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 the competent control authorities within SDG, uh, they take that into account in, in the risk analysis that we carry out. Um, so they'll give a weighting or score um, for membership of that. Um, in, in it. And they'll also give, uh, uh, I think, all, as well as the Farm Quality Assurance, Agri-Environment Schemes, Organic Farming Schemes, there, there's, there, there's various ones. Um, and we will give a, a weighting. Um, in, in the risk analysis. So when you, when you run the risk analysis every year um, against everybody who has applied into a scheme, obviously depending on, on the, nat of the nature of what they have done and what the, the weighting, we know what the factors are, um, they, they'll score. And you, so you'll, at the end of the day, you'll get a prioritised list from highest to lowest. And the ones you pick for, for your risk selection are the ones that are the, the highest. So if there is a requirement for selection to be made on the basis of risk, um, then that, that's where that earned recognition will, will come into play. OK, because given that veterinary service is also within DARD, why do you feel um, they, along with NIEA, have decided to deny this principle in their dealings with mm -hmm. farmers? Well, I suppose they and themselves are, are, are a competent control authority um, and so take responsibility for the inspections that they, that they carry out. They're accountable for them. Um, so uh, while I can't talk on, on their behalf, I imagine that they did consider it seriously but didn't think that it added effectively sufficiently in to be taken into the risk. In it's just risk they're under the umbrella of DAR. That's yeah. why I'm trying to get clarity around why 
they have denied that it's the principle of farmers. Would you not agree then that as we look at to better regulation, that when farmers jump through hoops and receive recognition from one government agency for doing so, this should be, where possible, extended others? Would you not agree that's a, a fair I think, point? I think where it's possible, um, but I think you, you do have to consider what, you know, the the relevance and the probably the, you know the the relevance to to what you're actually inspecting. So we you know we would carry out inspections on um, food and feed and, um, and and the gig standard with respect to, to land within SDG. Uh, veterinary service do the the animal identification ones, uh, and NAIA obviously do the, the pollution ones. So. As competent authorities, they, they need to take those decisions for themselves. I'm very aware, as I said, my husband's a beef farmer, so I'm very aware of everything that, that goes on in the hoops that do have to jump through. It just seems quite bizarre when they're under the umbrella of the department that they don't. Um, in response to the clerk's letter of 15th of December, I'm interested in the section on challenging the findings of the inspection report. Um, they said on rare occasions additional information for the farmers may in the original decision be reassessed. So given that this reassessment would be carried out by the same inspector who conducted the original inspection, how likely is it that more information would make this them change their, their own minds in essence? Are they going to change their own minds? How likely is it going, this going to happen? Well, I would, Im I, I would imagine that that would be information that the, that the inspector didn't have at the time he made his original assessment. Um, so he'll have made his assessment on the basis of, of what he sees on the day. But obviously, if a farmer is providing inf more information, well, then it is additional and it's adding to the picture you know, that he can take into account. But the um, picture wasn't there originally when he first inspected? I mean, it depends. On, it's, it's very much by a case by case basis, Joanne. I don't know what yeah. a farmer would, would will provide, but I'm sure the inspector will seek to consider what 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 is provided. It's just um, in your answer, answer to the clerk, um, you said that at this point, when all the state, there are no statistics available to identify how many times a breach has been removed in the circumstances mm -hmm. above. That's right. That would be very very useful. I feel to have that because it's. You know, there's certainly concern out there. It's the same person doing the, the inspection, and that's something that um, farmers are fearful of. So, why was this information not recorded? Because if we're supposed to be working towards better regulation, yet overturning a decision following an inspection is, is not important enough to be recorded? I, I don't know, Joanne. I think you make a good point. Uh, it's something that, 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 that we can take away and, and maybe add into the inspection report that if there is it a reassessment that is added there. That given yeah. the significance is not. So are you making a commitment then to review it? Is it likely to be reviewed? And I, think, I think the point that you're making is, is a good idea. Certainly if there has been a decision and that decision has been changed, it would be, use, it would be very useful to have it recorded why. So, yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Sure, could I just make a point on the, on the earned recognition? There is a, a review of uh, inspections that's ongoing at the moment, and that's one of the principles that they are actively looking at, earned recognition. I know veterinary service and the NIEA don't currently use it, but it is it's one of the criteria that has been looked at. So it's currently battery. been reviewed? Yes. Okay, it does just mean the same sensical to the farmers. Okay, that's great. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. Yeah. In relation to colours of animals and pesterage to give birth to colour and breed of an animal, uh, we understand that's not an EU uh, requirement uh, and it isn't, it's not required in other jurisdictions. Why here? That's right, and it's, it's been an ongoing debate right from the uh, original review of better regulation. John, um, provide some background on that. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's not a, a European requirement. The European requirement is that the member state or the keeper records either the breed or the colour of the animal. That's uh, one or the other. And in Northern Ireland, of course, we require both. Um, one thing I would say about that is the colour of the animal being available is potentially a benefit to the keeper in terms of whenever the, an animal with an injury query arrives at an abattoir. One of the factors to look at in terms of deciding whether to accept it in an abattoir or not would be colour, alongside the other issues about date of birth and, and breed and sex and so on. It also helps sometimes to resolve a, an error, where an error was made in terms of recording the breed, sex and date of birth. 
having colour there as a characteristic that we're aware of could help with an appeal to lift that uh, APHIS status that restricts the movement of the animal. You know. Um, Very seldom does that restriction be lifted, I, as far as I'm aware. I can declare an interest in a farmer myself. Yeah, I think of the IDQs that are applied, I think somewhere around half or slightly more than half are lifted. Uh, yeah, if, if, if the farmer comes to you very early in stage and, and notices that he has made a mistake himself, but apart from that, I doubt they're very, very seldom. But in, in a case where that happens, where someone, say, for instance, records the uh, males of a male, then come to us to have that changed, we do look at a whole range of other um, you know, characteristics recorded about the animal, date of birth, colour, breed, and the rest. And having the breed and the colour, because they're both quite subjective, having both together does give us a better description of the animal and gives us more evidence to go upon to, to lift a status one has been applied. In relation to colour, I mean, and I've said this before, I mean, being aware that dun can cover from red to white almost. And so, I mean, there's a big variation, and I know uh, some people laughed. Uh, I've paid heavy penalties for animals. I had one particular farmer, and this, uh, this is some time ago, and uh, the DNA sample proved that it was the right animal, but it still wasn't accepted by the department over a colour issue. So, I mean, I would have thought DNA was foolproof in this day and age, but obviously uh, it didn't seem to be so in that case. And, I mean, would you not have thought DNA was foolproof? No. Would that not be...? It establishes a link between the dam and the calf, or a calf. But there are issues around whether there are more than one calf, or you know whether it's a, uh, another sort of family relationship between the animals rather than dam and calf. You know, so it's not quite as straightforward as a guarantee that it's the animal you say it is. But certainly, it is one of the strongest pieces of evidence we have to to uh, to use to lift statuses where we can. Another issue is, inspector does a CIA inspection on some farms at one particular farm, and they said there's seven calves were older than he said them were. Uh, he, he disputes that strongly, but of course, is the inspector qualified to know exactly? I mean, yes, if, uh, you know, if an animal's a year old, you know, if it, you know, there is, but when it's very close, you know what I mean, if there's a, if there's a judgment call on that, should the inspector have the final say, if, if it's... Well, this is the issue, a lot of the things like date of birth, the age, and the breed and the, and the colour are subjective, and therefore the more the indicators we have, of those, the more accurate it can be in terms of assessing whether the animal is the animal that it says, that its tag number says it is. So, you know, if we lose one element of the characteristics, then we're putting more emphasis on the others. That would put more pressure on the accurate breed recording, maybe than we have now. In terms of the breed, then it got much more important. So, does the age of the animal? You know, so the more indicators we have, the more we have as a department to go upon. If we're trying to uh, find a way to lift the status on an animal, you know, if that if there is enough evidence there to lift the status, that's something we can do. But where we lose elements of the, the, the description of the animal, then it becomes more difficult to have the status. Not individual cases I'm going to do by any means, but I know one farmer who's a CIA who has had an inspection and he's told, he was told that there was six calves that were not the age that he said they were. He strongly contests that, but he's going to be fined very heavily out of a single farm payment because of that. Uh, I mean, is the, uh, is the Department of Law officer? able to define exactly the date of birth of that. You know, I think there is some issues there that can be clear-cut, but some are certainly not. And uh, some officials are very are being ad adamant where they haven't, maybe in my eyes, the uh, very few people can tell to a week when an animal was born or two weeks. Mm. Uh, yeah, after number one, so I think that would have been almost nigh impossible. I mean, you know, declare an interest, but uh, at one point he has a very heavy penalty from a single farm payment, and he strongly contests that, contests that that is the. So, you know, department officials sometimes can be very prescriptive and and um, make decisions that are very difficult to overturn because they're the inspector. Would you accept that? No. Well, I think there's a, there's a basket of evidence there, and the more evidence that you have, then it gives more weight to the decision. But there are grey areas, and it's, it's there are grey areas. If there's a grey area, why should it fall against the farmer? If it's grey, I'm close. I mean, that it seems to be the the department's. Uh, you know, if, if it's close, one would have thought the, the judgment call should. If it's that close, that they can't identify, they can't be certain. I mean, uh, one would have thought that it should fall on the side of the farmer, not on the side of the department. 
Well, we don't know the yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I, I fully understand. But, it, but the more objective the assessment, the better. Yeah. Uh, and the absence of subjective evidence, the more, uh, on the absence of objective evidence, the more subjective criteria that can be applied, at least there's a better chance of, of uh, coming to the, the same conclusion from one inspector as another inspector. Yeah, okay. Any other members? Sydney, Sydney Anderson? Yeah. Are we okay? Anyone else? Just, just, just to weave on to that point, and declaring it was a summit as a bit of farming as well. Do the collate, do you collate the sort of the number of instances of the grey areas? No, I'm thinking, you know, at the end of the year when you when you review practice and so on, um, do you do you look at those grey areas to see maybe we need a bit more discretion there? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. John. Now we do know the number of. Restriction statuses are lifted each year, so we know the number that are resolved, but we wouldn't know how many were, you know, considered those sort of grey areas. You know, we just know the ones that were able to be resolved. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Members, uh, can I advise members that we now need to decide how to proceed with the inquiry? Would it be better maybe to close session for a few minutes, just so that people can be candid and open on what they want to say? Is members feeling on that? Okay, close session for a few minutes. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Northern Ireland. <coughs> we have an oral briefing, uh, Dard, uh, Evidence and Innovation Strategy 2015-17. Uh, Can members to the member from the clerk at pages 60 to 62. Papers provided by the Department of pages 63 to 126. Can I welcome Foster Carson, uh, Central Policy Research Policy Branch, Pauline, Paul Devlin, Senior Scientific Officer, Central Policy. Dance advisory, you're very welcome. And I'll ask you to make your presentation. We'll give you up to 10 minutes, OK? Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, the DART Evidence and Innovation Strategy 2009 to 2013 has provided an overarching framework for all of DART funded research and development. Uh, needed to generate the evidence base for policy development and delivery, for robust policy development and delivery. It's also underpinned the Department's contribution to promoting innovation amongst rural businesses. Whilst the overall uh, framework of the principles for commissioning research and development are robust and so remain in place, is recognised there was a need to refresh the strategy. The updating of the evidence innovation strategy to cover the period through to 2017 has been completed. The work was informed by the opinions and views of our stakeholders, uh, garnered through an online uh, questionnaire. We sought to learn lessons from research commissioning systems used elsewhere in the UK and Ireland, and with direct engagement with a range of stakeholders. The updated strategy will act as a bridging document, a bridging document between the DARD Evans Innovation Strategy 2009 to 2013 and the development of a longer term research and development strategy for the new department the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Our updated bridging strategy will provide the framework for funding DARD policy relevant and industry relevant research and innovation during the period prior to the establishment of DERA and for a period of at least one year following the establishment of the new department. So over the coming year, the research and innovation needs of the new department will be identified, appraised and formally evaluated so as to be included in the new DERA evidence and innovation strategy. Our vision for our bridging document, our, our current Evans Innovation Strategy, is promoting a sustainable rural community and agri-food, fishing and forestry sectors by funding policy-relevant research and supporting industry-relevant innovation, which is responsive to local needs. The strategic evidence and innovation needs and the research required to fulfil these needs will continue to be coordinated through four programme management boards that align with DART's strategic goals. Stakeholders will continue to play an important role in identifying and refining the research programmes and ensuring that DARD has a clear understanding of the priority, priorities of the sector and the challenges that will be faced. In particular, in moving forward, emphasis will be placed on ensuring close linkages with the Agri-Food Strategy Board and giving due consideration to the Executive's response to the re recommendations of the Going for Growth report. 
We're also seeking to uh, build stronger linkages between our research agenda and the Rural Development Programme, utilising research to assess the effectiveness of the programme and to inform policy. A key message from the analysis underpinning the new RDP is a role that enhanced skills and knowledge levels can play in ensuring sustainable development of the agri-food sector. Consequently, we will look to harness knowledge transfer mechanisms funded through the RDP to ensure that the latest findings from our research activities are fed through to end users. And likewise, to ensure that information from end users uh, comes back to help set the research agenda in a strategic manner. Collaboration and partnership are reoccurring themes in the new strategy as we look to build strong linkages with research funders across the UK and Ireland and with international partners. It's recognised that multidisciplinary research teams and organisations are required to address the increasingly complex issues that the agri-food sector is, is facing. Through such collaboration, we will seek to maximise the research capacity that is available from our investments in research to best meet our evidence and innovation needs. If I could briefly turn to our research commissioning itself and the four main uh, research channels through which we fund uh, R&D. I'll highlight some of the main features. First, looking at the DARD funded, uh, the DARD directed AFP research programme. Whilst our bridging strategy sets out a framework for research, the detailed evidence and innovation activities will continue to be coordinated through four programme management boards, which, as I said, align broadly with DARD strategic priorities. One of the major roles and responsibilities of each of these pre, uh, programme management boards is to review, to identify and prioritise investment in ever, evidence gathering or innovation support activity. As I've already detailed, evidence, evidence and innovation needs are identified by policy branches are informed by both informal and formal engagement with stakeholders. This forms the basis of the annual research programme commissioning document. The 2016-17 version of the document will be uploaded to the DARD website in the coming days, with research proposals due to be submitted to DARD by the 8th of April. In 2015, we commissioned 28 new research projects from the DARD-directed AFB Research and Development Programme, covering a range of um, evidence needs and a range of, of means of supporting innovation uh, through research. As mentioned previously, during 2016, PMBs, our programme management boards, will engage closely with the Agri-Food Strategy Board in taking forward the concept of working groups for the ENI programme, based on the Agri-Food Strategy Board subgroups for the ENI programme. These groups will be augmented with relevant researchers and other stakeholders as appropriate. The stakeholder working groups, these are the, the groups that will be based on the, the subgroups of the Agri-Food Strategy Board, will focus on the innovation needs of the agri-food sector and the wider rural community to help meet the targets within the Going for Growth report. Particular emphasis will be given to the development of longer-term programmes of research in selected areas with linkages to evidence-based projects as appropriate. The wider implications of the creation of the new department will also be considered. It's anticipated that these working groups will take place, uh, meetings uh, will take place between March and June of this year, with a stakeholder conference to follow. The framework for the stakeholder engagement is agreed in principle by the Agri-Food Strategy Board and the UFU. Just a brief update on our postgraduate scheme. Uh, you'll be aware from previous briefings that DARD awards up to 12 new PhD studentships uh, per year. Uh, research proposals must be aligned to priority research areas to, to support strategic objectives of the department. But PhD studentships are the, the dual benefit of developing the research capability in the agri-food sector, whilst also helping to develop leaders for the future. Applications for the current scheme close at 5 p.m. this afternoon. In terms of the Research Challenge Fund, uh, this represents the industry-led competitive research funding, which aims to encourage industry and public sector research establishments to collaborate on innovative, high-quality, pre-commercial research and development. Taking that theme of collaboration further to our new uh, programme of collaborative research, we have long-standing co-funding relationships with industry levy boards, such as AgriSearch, which has helped us to resource the developments of on-farm research programmes, for example. Building on this, a key focus of our updated evidence innovation strategy is collaboration with other regions and countries to effectively expand both the research capacity that is available to the industry here and the range of the research that we can afford to fund. In this regard, uh, DARD has entered into agreement with the Department of Food, Agriculture and Marine uh, in Dublin to co-fund selected projects involving NI partners within the recently launched DAFM Competitive Research Call. 
Supporting this research call, we feel, demonstrates a progressive uh, opportunity for commissioning research and will help promote collaboration between research organisations in Ireland, both north and south. A similar collaborative approach is being taken following an extension of the US-Ireland Research and Development Partnership, which is now to include agriculture. In this collaboration to be launched later uh, this year, DARD will fund research organisations uh, from the north in successful collaborative projects involving research partners uh, in, in the south uh, and also in the US. Collaborative funding opportunities with the UK research councils and other GB funding bodies are also being explored. These collaborative research programmes, importantly, are also aimed at helping to establish partnerships amongst research organisations on which Horizon 2020 proposals can be developed. And just a word on Horizon 2020 to, to finish. You will be aware of Horizon 2020, the EU's competitive uh, funding programme. Horizon 2020 is an emphasis on, on excellent science and industry leadership and tackling societal challenges. The goal is to ensure that Europe produces world-class science and removes barriers to innovation. GARD has funded one of the 15 members of the Northern Ireland Contact Point Network. The Contact Point Network and the Agri-Food Contact, based in AFPI, but with a region-wide remit, has responsibilities for supporting applications to agri-food. Horizon 2020 funding for agri-food under Societal Challenge 2 to date amounts to €1.3 million Euro for projects with call deadlines up to May last year. Additional funding for the agri-food area has been drawn down for other parts of Horizon 2020, notably for Marie Curie programme. In looking forward in Horizon 2020, the significant budget expected uh, to support the calls and topics in the final period of Horizon 2020 is most welcome and will provide further opportunities for continuing the development of research collaborations with Ireland and with other regions. So in drawing to a close, I hope I've given you a feel for how the Evans Innovation Strategy, updated for 2015-2017, provides an overarching framework for research and development to underpin evidence-based policy uh, and delivery and to promote innovation in agri-food, farming, forestry and other rural businesses. Thanks uh, for your attention, uh, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, chapter 9 uh, of your document it talks about the delivery of the strategy. It makes reference to financial constraints and targeting uh, funding. Well, how much money do you anticipate that DARD will spend uh, across the period of the strategy between 2015-17? Um, it varies across the, um, the, the, the different um, research programmes. Uh, the, the, the bridging document introduces the new collaborative research programmes themselves. Um, this is, uh, for example, the US-Ireland Research and Development Partnership that we talked about uh, and co-funding the DAFM Competitive Research Call, uh, also for the collaborative funding within the Research Challenge Fund. Uh, in this, uh, successful projects um, have partners in each of the jurisdictions. So, for example, in the DAFM Competitive Research Call, we fund the Northern Ireland partner in research projects that involve uh, organisations north and south. Um, this allows us to effectively leverage additional resource for investment in, in R&D, um, and that comes through in the US Ireland as well. It also allows us to broaden out uh, our research programme and draw on uh, expertise from elsewhere as well but also funding a core uh, research uh, base in Northern Ireland. This is particularly focused on early stage scientists. So the funding uh, promotes funding for uh, postdoctorate scientists and PhD studentships. This is a new funding stream uh, for, for the department in, in moving forward, uh, Chair, in, through collaboration. And we feel in terms of leverage that it will leave between uh, th a ratio of between three and five to one for the funding that, that we are putting into it. Uh, in terms of um, PhD studentships, we um, uh, again this year are funding up to 12 PhD studentships. This is an increase in 50% over uh, our, our funding in, in, uh, uh, in a previous period. Um, and we feel this is, an, uh, again, uh, uh, a worthwhile investment, both in, in terms of meeting our, our, our evidence and innovation needs, but also helping to train uh, uh, young scientists uh, in a research training, but also in, uh, leaders for the industry in the future. Uh, in terms of the, the DAR directed AFPI research programme, as I indicated, we have funded 28 new research and development projects uh, in moving forward. Our research call uh, is out at the minute to, to AFPI, uh, and we will prioritise the research that comes into, into us in terms of, of um, 
the, the policy need for the work, the, the strategic impact of, of the research um, and um, the collaborations that, that it promote. So we are seeing to, to invest in, in our research and development through each of the channels uh, that we have developed and we are seeking to build new collaborations with research councils uh, in the UK and other research funders themselves. So in terms of R&D, we, we recognise as an important policy tool for the department uh, and we are looking to invest in it as we go forward uh, through each of these, these uh, channels. Okay, well, I think what you're saying is you have a clear amount of money to spend, is it dependent on other things? Depending, you have a, a, a clear budget uh, for the next two years, 2015-17. Yeah, for a, for our collaborative research project, um, our, co our collaborative research program, uh, we have a budget. Of course, the actual amount we we um, we allocate depends on successful projects, you know, crossing the line in it. But we have a new budget for that. Um, uh, chair and um, for the other areas of work as well in terms of prioritising the work within the, the DARD uh, directed AFPI work programme. Mm. We're looking at our research needs alongside mm. our, our statutory um, requirements, surveillance, diagnostics and making sure that they're prioritised appropriately. Okay. okay. Sean, Sean. Thanks. That's a very interesting presentation, I suppose. Just <laughs> thinking about particularly these business development groups that have been launched recently. Well, a lot of this research was disseminated down to that. Would you expect um, research to come out of the business development groups mm -hmm. to feed back into your research? Yes. Uh, I may just give a short presentation in reference to the, the uh, trying to embed the research agenda into the rural development programme. And it is very much a two-way process. We, say that we see the business development groups being a, a, a very effective way of disseminating the, the latest uh, research findings, but also getting information from the industry to help set the research agenda itself. So we see that as a very positive development in terms of uh, ensuring the maximum impact for the investment in research um, uh, that we put in. Obviously, uh, maximising the, the uptake of research findings is actually a key priority for us, um, because research we see as a policy tool, um, not just for, uh, we're not investing in research just for the sake of the research itself, but the impact in terms of uh, policy development and innovation in the industry. Um, the second uh, component to, to the research are uh, the rural development programmes, rather, is that in moving forward, um, there will be the establishment of operational groups. And this is bringing together uh, within uh, strategic groups um, industry, uh, researchers, uh, advisors, technologists, uh, to look at particular issues that require work in moving forward. And again, we see that as a way of promoting close engagement with the industry and maximising uptake and helping to, to, to direct the research agenda as well. Yeah. Just one more, Chair. You talked about collaboration with the, with the South. What sort of collaborative projects are, are taking place there? Um, well, the research call I, I, um, that, I, that I mentioned, the Daffin Competitive Research Call, in which we co-fund, covers a range of areas of innovation from primary uh, production uh, through environmental issues uh, through to, to um, some aspects of, of uh, food quality. Um, and we have identified within the overall uh, Daffin Research Call areas of strategic importance to, to DARD, in which we've agreed to co-fund. So the actual proposals have been submitted. They will be undergoing are undergoing evaluation at the minute, and later in the year will be the first time that we are co-funding yeah. our research projects on a north-south basis. But the proposals come in span right from primary production agriculture and right across the various sectors, right through to environmental um, uh, projects. I think we've seen examples as well. <clears throat> For example, on uh, fertilizer efficiency, where we funded a project which is pretty similar to one in, in the south, and by combining them together. Uh, you know, a, a project like that type would get more bang for buck, really. Um, so there are examples where there is a um, good uh, cross linkage between research groups in, in the north and, and, and south. And uh, so there are opportunities, and, and we see those opportunities coming forward in the proposals uh, through the Daffin Call and to build on those, those, uh, those academic collaborations through through co-funding joint projects rather than maybe looking at things separately and risking duplication in some areas. And I suppose just when you talk about fertiliser efficiency and so on, you know, how do we get the message out there? Because I heard a statistic today that only 3% of land is actually soil sampled for some years. Yeah. How do we get the message out there? Then? I think it's a, I think there's, there's a combination of, of a, uh, 
building on the work that Camfrey are already doing in that area, um, uh, and also selling the benefits of, of getting that type of information. Um, uh, so there are uh, various things been. Uh, uh, various instruments been looked at to try and promote that further, but uh, uh, the messages are not new ones. So I suppose from a from an innovation or, or evidence gathering <coughs> perspective, it, it doesn't necessarily require innovation or new research. It, uh, it's more on the delivery end, but dissemination. But, dissemination. But I suppose and there's potential for innovation in terms of, of how that message is put across and, and, the, and the benefits of of uh, of soil sampling. So research that we have done is looking at different ways of uh, dissemination of, of information, the relative merits of that, and, and on, the, on the, using the information that was collected through that research then, the case for the business development groups, for example, was established. So new initiatives like this would be seen as adding some uh, stimulus in terms of um, knowledge transfer of, of the research, both the latest research findings and research findings that are, that, that are there but haven't been adopted, um, but would be of, of benefit to, to, the, to the sector itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Robin. Robin. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> Thanks, John. Um, picking up, sorry, there on just the deputy chair's point. Seven four four of your paper, which is uh, sustainable manure and nutrient management, and then moving on to seven five one, which is novel and innovative pro approaches to manure and nutrient management. What steps are you taking, especially in regards to poultry waste? I suppose it's uh, you'll, you'll maybe be uh, well aware, Robin, of, of the uh, the work that's been undertaken. I suppose uh, on the sustainable uh, utilisation of poultry litter project and uh, how that began with the uh, SBRI project. And I suppose it's a good example of where uh, uh, Daddy and Dard worked together on, on uh, uh, a specific um, uh, competition to, to allow promotion uh, or to allow a number of ideas to come forward. So it was a good example of, of, uh, of funding short-term projects which allowed small businesses and startups to come forward with ideas and, uh, and that's developed over a period of time to try and uh, look at innovative solutions and particularly for poultry litter which uh, I suppose uh, is a difficult one to, uh, to, to manage because of its, uh, of its nature. Uh, our soils are, uh, tend to be high in phosphorus um, so the, the uh, the routes that other countries would use to uh, to utilise poultry litter are not open to um, uh, to, to farmers here. Um, so I suppose in terms of, of uh, um, the uh, research and innovation, uh, uh, the it was a slightly slightly different from your traditional uh, research project, and that uh, we funded uh, 13 separate uh, small projects, and of those, uh, a number of, of stronger ones came forward, which which uh, promoted uh, anaerobic digestion as a solution or or uh, enhanced anaerobic digestion, and uh, uh, through supporting those, um, uh, we're, we're seeing solutions come forward. So, so what's the next step, I suppose, as of those was 13 projects that are out there? What stages are each of those 13 at? The, the, that, that was the, the SBRI, so the first phase. Um, that led on to the, the, the SUPL project, um, which uh, looked at uh, ways to, um, uh, to support uh, the um, I suppose the next phase in that, which, which is uh, looking at uh, uh, loan funding to potentially one or two uh, significant scale demonstrator plants. So going from something quite fundamental and obvious to uh, plants which would treat um, 20 to 25,000 tonnes a year as demonstrator plants. And if those are successful and those are a going concern, then you would, uh, um, those could be the, the seed then for the next step, which would be, a, 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 I suppose, solutions which would uh, address a larger uh, proportion of the surplus. Any idea of timeline on that? Uh, again, maybe not in a position to, um, to uh, give a timeline, but I know that, 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 that others and, and, uh, uh, from uh, environmental farming, uh, Brian Irvine maybe is going to provide an update on that uh, at some point in the near future. Okay, right. uh, in regards to the loan funding, is that taken as a daddy initiative? Well, it's, I think it's a, uh, it's a joint uh, daddy dard uh, initiative, um, I think, with, with the Strategic Investment Board also involved. Specifically for poultry litter. Yeah. Okay, Jim. Okay. okay. One more. Uh, any other members? Yeah, Edward. Uh, Obviously, one of the the big areas that, that we have in terms of research requirement is in relation to soils, soil analysis, um, and not just phosphates but nitrates. Uh, um, obviously, Loch Ness was. Designated some time ago as a nitrate one zone. By the fact that it's more of a phosphate problem and has a nitrate one. So, when are we 
going to get the, the quality science that will allow us to properly utilise the resources that we'll have in terms of nutrients because having nutrients is a good thing um, because it will reduce uh, the amount of money that you spend on, on, on artificial fertilisers. And I don't think that we are in a situation at this point in Northern Ireland where nutrients are being properly utilised at this stage. Maybe, Paul, I'll make a, a, a couple of, of, of comments and, and then, then you can add um, to them. <clears throat> well, first of all, the, um, the area of, of um, soils and um, sustainable um, uh, soil nutrients um, has, has been a key um, uh, area for the commissioning of, of research. So, in the, in the research call that, that we have just issued, um, uh, for AFP, uh, the Dar directed AFP programme. Uh, two areas of, of interest are in the management of soil nutrients for sustainable grass based dairy production uh, in Northern Ireland and in terms of, of Loch Ney, quantification of phosphorus release from sediments in, in Loch Ney. So we see very much science um, and the importance of science and information um, uh, directing um, really our, our agri food sector and our, our land use. Uh, strategy, which is being developed in, in, by a group led by John Gilliland, uh, uh, being the overall knowledge base on which the future strategy will be developed. And we're commissioning some research where there are evidence gaps uh, to help that work um, uh, uh, develop and, and progress. So I suppose to answer your question in terms of harnessing, harnessing the uh, information that we've got al already, I think the, the development of the agri-food um, uh, land use management strategy will be a, a, a key strategy in terms of ensuring that our overall strategy in moving forward um, for both a sustainable agri-food sector, but also in, in enhancing the, the environment uh, will be driven. And, and if there are evidence and, and gaps um, that need to be addressed uh, and taking forward, um, we are responsible for commissioning those. And in our most recent document, there are two areas which we are, we are seeking to address. Yeah, I, I think maybe Paul yeah. just on, on. It's also worth mentioning that some of these uh, impacts, in terms of changes in in, in agriculture practice, have long-term implications. Um, so, for example, in the in the Loch Ne, in the Loch ne uh, issue, in terms of release of nutrients from sediments, is a, an area of particular uh, interest. Yeah, I, I suppose there 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 are maybe two drivers. Um, uh, the the commission and the need, uh, uh, you know, the, with the. Uh, the nitrous action plan derogation and the need to build evidence uh, for that. Uh, um, we know that the, the status of Loch Ney is, is, is something they've got a close eye on, and uh, uh, there isn't a quick fix for that. Um, but I suppose it is a case of, of uh, um, uh, having evidence to show them that you're uh, making best efforts to, um, to achieve improvements there. And uh, part of that, um, we would hope, uh, will be a part of that evidence will be through a, an evidence and innovation project which looks at the, I suppose, the under, underpinning. Uh, uh, processes within Loch Ney. So there's a, a very detailed and, and integrated uh, project which uh, we would hope to see come forward. I suppose the other aspect of it, to agree with your point, is that uh, um, when it comes to, uh, to nutrients, there's great potential in, in, in soil as well, which maybe hasn't uh, been fully realised in terms of the, uh, the yields of, of, uh, of, of grass. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's, I know that CAFRI have uh, uh, a number of programmes in terms of, of uh, 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 encouraging farmers to adopt uh, better practices of, of, of nutrient management, um, and the ultimate goal is maybe to, to, to increase grass production. So that's a, that's a, uh, there are activities going on there, both I suppose in terms of the research and innovation end and on the extension end through CAFRI. Are we seeing less eutrophication of, of the log? It's, it, it's uh, I suppose without uh, without going into great detail, it's a. Uh, um, the, the the science almost indicates that you have a, a sediment uh, a sediment uh, uh, level within within there. So even if there there is no runoff into Loch Ney, and that sediment um, uh, could uh, you know the the redissolution of that sediment can maintain the phosphorus levels in there. Um, it's quite a difficult thing, I suppose, to put across to the commission unless you have detailed evidence to show that. But there's a there's a complicated process in there, um, which would I suppose indicate that it will be hard to reduce the phosphorus levels in Loch Ney, even if you were to reduce the the level of runoff into Loch Ney. It's to do with the fact that the sediments uh, there's a lot of phosphorus in there in a in a uh, partially soluble form. Um, I don't know that technical facts. 
dissolving if, if, if you want to get I think that's, to that, that's a question that's been asked in the research that we're commissioning to look at the, the time scales to meet the nutrient and, and biological targets um, because as Paul was saying of, of the, the the release and the rate of release of those nutrients are issues that we're trying to get hard data on well, are we looking at years or are we looking at decades or even longer we're looking at decades I, I suppose uh, but the I think what we're hoping is that uh, the uh, Improvement over a, over a period of time. You can show that your your farm practice improves. You can show that you're making incremental improvements. But between uh, nitrous action plan derogation periods, you're unlikely to see a huge change. Or uh, uh, <coughs> just because of the nature of the biological and chemical processes in there, it's not a it's not a quick fix. Or a quick fix is impossible. And is the removal of sand from the lock actually helpful in terms of reducing the phosphorus in it? It's maybe a difficult thing to, to determine, really. Uh, it may not have any impact at all, but uh, there wouldn't be, to my knowledge, there isn't evidence around that. Um, mm. But it's a complicated chemical and biological process, which... Uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously, that's in the bed. It, it is, yeah. You know, if, if, <coughs> I'm just asking the, the question, is it capable of, of absorbing phosphorus, which then you know, dissolves at, at, a, at a later point, and therefore, if you're removing sand from the bed of the lock, is that potentially taking the phosphorus out of it? Is that, is that an environmental advantage? I don't know. I'm only pose, posing the question because I know there's a big debate about that at the moment. It, it, it may be yeah. something that this project helps uh, helps elaborate on, but it, I suppose it, uh, we have an evidence need in that area, and, and uh, uh, that dynamic equilibrium um, of the sediments within Loch Ness is something we hope to, to gather evidence on. You mentioned anaerobic digestion there, uh, and <clears throat> essentially, uh, what goes into the digester does that not come out of it again? You know, you're taking you're taking the gas off it, but in terms of the nitrates and phosphates and so forth, you know, if, if you're putting chicken manure, for example, in there, is that is is the material the digestion? Is it not going to be extremely high in, 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 in nitrates? And maybe a quick word on the, the form of what's coming out, uh, and I'll, I'll comment just on the, the nutrient availability. Mm. I suppose it, it, there, are, uh, in terms of phosphorus, yes, the, what, what goes in comes out. Um, uh, it isn't necessarily the case for nitrogen. Uh, it is possible to uh, remove so, some of the nitrogen uh, with, with uh, so certain pretreatment processes. Um, uh, but it, with standard AD, it is the case that the nitrogen that goes in uh, and the phosphorus that goes in comes out. But uh, as Alistair maybe uh, explained, the availability of that nitrogen changes. Um, could you turn interest in that I supply the gesture, but nonetheless. Yeah. Availability of the nitrogen um, is improved for, for plants. So the in in real terms the fertilizer value um, of the nitrogen component of, of the digestate is higher than than the, the original slurry itself. Of course then the, the, the form of the slurry in terms of many of these systems have separation involved um, with the fibre and liquid fractions helping in storage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, in, in relation to water quality, I, I understood there was some improvements in water quality in Loch Ness. Is that, is that the case? I think in terms of the, the, the longer term trends, there certainly was a, an increase uh, in water quality um, uh, in, in the early, uh, uh, from 2008 2009 uh, on. Um, I suppose that the uh, we want to see those trends continuing, and uh, you know there may be some evidence of those improvements plateauing out. Um, so I don't think we can be complacent on that front. But uh, the uh, it's, it's it's a complicated complicated thing, I suppose, in terms of, of uh, um, the processes which uh, uh, can uh, impact on water quality. So the, so the general trend was good for a number of years, but I don't think we can comp be complacent. What thought of this? But, uh, uh, very high level of rainfall, there'd be a big change in, in, in water. You know what I mean? Moving out and moving in, wouldn't you? Yeah. If it changes, of course, in river water quality are quicker, as you as you know. It's the lakes and the locks where where, yeah. where it's where it's slower. Yeah. That's having robust data around that. Okay. Okay, members. Everyone having up? Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to agenda item 8, oral briefings and large support for areas of natural constraint, designated designation of areas of natural constraint and a review of couple of support options. I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 128 to 130 and papers provided by the department at pages 131 
236. Uh, can I welcome along Norman Fulton, uh, Chief Agricultural Economist, Central Policy, Rosemary A.G., Central Policy, Policy Development Branch, Mark McLean, uh, Principal Agricultural Economist, Central Policy, Policy Development Branch. You're very welcome. And we'll give you up to 10 minutes to make a presentation and okay. you can ask some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, yes, uh, three consultations that are uh, uh, being launched today. Uh, and you'll have uh, copies uh, of, of those documents. So, first one is options for future support for areas of natural constraint. Committee is aware that uh, we have an areas uh, of natural constraint scheme uh, operating for two years uh, under the, uh, the RDP. Uh, that's for claims in 2016 and 2017. So, programmed in for two years only. Um, and uh, so this consultation then really fulfils a ministerial commitment to review the, re the arrangements beyond uh, the 2016 claim year. Uh, I'm seeking views uh, on potential future uh, options uh, for support in these areas. ANC support is a, an income support, uh, so it needs to be examined in the context of the, uh, the parallel Pillar 1 uh, income support measures. They've never got a complete picture. Uh, and so that's what we've done uh, within the, the consultation uh, document. A total of seven options are presented uh, in the document. Um, first one uh, is, is do nothing. Uh, we, we could simply uh, run the second year of, of the ANC scheme and uh, let it lapse. Uh, and uh, there is no requirement to have an ANC support scheme uh, within Pillar 2 or indeed Pillar 1. Uh, so that is, a, is an option. Uh, we have options around operating a, a, a measure within Pillar 1, uh, which would involve uh, taking up to 5% of the Pillar 1 support budget uh, and paying it as a top-up to the basic payment uh, scheme across all claimants uh, who are located within the area of natural constraint. Um, so that would have to, have to operate on the new ANC designated area, so we couldn't operate that on the, on the existing LFA boundaries. And if we were to use that uh, option, we'd have to notify the Commission uh, of our intent uh, by the 1st of August uh, this year. So we've uh, a couple of uh, options uh, presented uh, ar around that. Uh, we also have the option of, of transferring funding between Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 to continue uh, uh, an ANC measure in Pillar 2. Uh, if we were to try to maintain a £20 million uh, spend, uh, as we do have at the minute, then that would represent an 8.3% transfer from Pillar 1 mm -hmm. to Pillar 2. Unfortunately, the earliest we could do that uh, would be uh, a transfer out of Pillar 1 in 2018, uh, and so the funds would only be available in 2019 uh, to fund uh, an ANC measure out of Pillar 2. Um, and it wouldn't be the same ANC measure that we currently have, it would have to be a new ANC scheme uh, it would um, accord with the new ANC uh, RDP requirements and would operate on the new ANC boundaries. Uh, so you'd have a, a two-year gap between the ending of the current arrangement uh, and the beginning of the, the new arrangement if we were to go down uh, that particular route. You could, of course, have a, a hybrid um, between uh, the Pillar 1 and the Pillar 2 options um, to try and bring, um, carry you through that gap. Uh, so we've presented uh, possibilities around that. Um, and all of, the, all of the, the possibilities described here are really about uh, operating within the, the current uh, funding uh, available. <coughs> uh, so we're not bringing any new money to the table in, in any of these. So the final two options we've looked at uh, are involve bringing additional national monies uh, to the table. Obviously, that would require additional funding from the block uh, against a very difficult uh, public sector finances uh, position. Um, if we were to continue to operate um, an ANC scheme in Pillar 2 <coughs> national monies, we could only continue for one further year uh, on using the current scheme and the current boundary. And from 2018, uh, it would be uh, a new scheme and on the new boundary. So consultation uh, is out on that, and we're seeking uh, stakeholder views. The second issue then is on the designation of areas of natural constraint. Uh, this is linked, obviously, uh, to uh, options. Uh, we have to designate uh, the new areas of natural constraint uh, by no later than 1st of January 2018. Uh, but some of the options, uh, if we were to use them, for example, Pillar 1 options, we'd have to bring that forward uh, by, by a year. 
the process of uh, designation is a two-stage process. First stage is biophysical characteristics, uh, <laughs> so it's the soil, climate, the interaction between the two, and slope. Uh, so that uh, is the initial <coughs> biophysical uh, assessment of, of disadvantage. Uh, and then that is followed up by a second stage fine tuning uh, uh, exercise, which is mandatory. Um, and that uh, really looks at um, the effects of uh, investment uh, or economic activity. Uh, and fine tuning can only ever remove areas that are otherwise uh, designated under the biophysical approach. It cannot add uh, to that. The boundaries have to be uh, using existing administrative boundaries, so uh, wards, for example. Um, so we have um, a number of map maps included within the consultation document uh, and seeking stakeholder views uh, on some of the approaches uh, that we're setting out there. The final map will have to be approved by the EU Commission. Uh, the biophysical uh, uh, exercise uh, will be examined by the Joint Research Council. Uh, and the, the fine-tuning uh, by DG Agri, um, and the overall uh, approval process is via modification to the Rural Development Programme. Third consultation, then, is uh, a review of uh, CAP Couple Support. The um, committee will be aware that, uh, as part of the 2014 decisions on CAP uh, reform, uh, we did not uh, implement any couple support uh, measures. Uh, there wasn't a strong rationale to do so, and there wasn't uh, significant stakeholder support for such an approach. Nevertheless, we did keep that option uh, open, uh, and so uh, we now have a window to re-examine uh, that uh, possibility. If we were to uh, choose to introduce a couple support measure, then we would have to notify it uh, to the Commission by no, longer la no later than the 1st of August uh, this year, uh, and that will be our last opportunity within this mandate uh, of the, the CAP. Uh, so uh, we have presented some, um, some analysis looking at uh, what has been happening recently, particularly in the uh, sucker cow and uh, sheep sectors, uh, and we're asking stakeholder uh, views uh, on this. Uh, as to whether there's any, any rationale uh, for the introduction of couple support at this point in time. So, uh, consultation launched, uh, all three consultations launched today, closing uh, 29th of uh, April, um, and we would envisage coming back um, to present to the, I suppose, the, the DERA committee uh, once uh, we would have uh, an analysis of the responses to that consultation. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, can you confirm how many farmers will actually receive ANC payments in this year, 2016 year? Uh, this year it's just over 10,000 uh, applied uh, to the measure of this year, um, so you know, probably slightly less than that uh, will, will be valid claims, but it's, it's around that sort of number. We, we envisage around 9,500. What's the total amount of money they receive? Actually? 20 million. Uh, 20 million. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. As we move to awards, and I'll keep me right on this, a flat rate, do they not <coughs> benefit from that? That's correct. Uh, within a single region model that we have and move towards flat rate, it moves about £2.8 million pounds per annum. Um, £2.8 million per annum. Um, incrementally uh, over the, the transition period uh, into the SDA. Now, obviously, uh, that's the aggregate position. The uh, position for individual farmers will depend on their individual circumstances. I understand uh, that. But, uh, but at, the, that. At, the end of, at the end of the day, they will receive more than that. Well, they mightn't. It wouldn't be far away. The uh, amount of money won't be far away, wouldn't it? If you actually look at the, the analysis we have, yes, in the, in the document, that uh, if you're simply looking at the level of support that they received in 2014, uh, between uh, the SFP, last year the SFP, and uh, LFA support in that year, roll that forward to uh, 2021, yeah. uh, whenever we're at a flat rate, it's, it's broadly the same. Um, uh, well, that's only from Pillar 1. Yeah. Um, so we have that um, shown in the, in the consultation documents. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah that's okay. Uh, in relation to couple of payments, um, uh, has the department, uh, for instance, Circular cow sheep sectors. Um, the latest statistics is what's the situation? 
Uh, I do feel have some sympathy with those two particular groups. Yep. Uh, again, we've presented that within the consultation document. Uh, the uh, Sukhrakai numbers um, really in indicating no trend, really. Uh, I mean, we had uh, post decoupling in 2005, the numbers uh, decreased as we were expecting that they would. Um, and they haven't really they sort of leveled off around about 2009, and, and uh, I think there's some small recovery uh, thereafter, but it, it, there, there's no strong trend thereafter. Uh, sheep sector um, actually they've, they've come back up ag again a bit from that uh, round about that 2009 2010. Uh, so at this point in time, no, there's no indication of any significant uh, decline in these. What did other regions of the UK and the Republic do? Have they any support? Couple support? Uh, Scotland uh, have a couple support uh, measure in for both beef and sheep. I think around 10% overall uh, of their pillar one uh, budget uh, is allocated towards. A uh, couple support measures. Uh, they have, I believe, two versions uh, of uh, their couple support for beef. Uh, one for sort of Highland and Island. Uh, I think it's on a uh, three-quarter bred uh, beef calves. Okay. Uh, and then they have a, a heritage payment on on sheep. Um, it may well be in the Highlands and Islands only, is it? Not on hogs. Yeah. So anyway, they have um, uh, both uh, on both those sectors. Um, obviously, it, it makes it for a much more complicated uh, regime. I think the Republic has some sort of a scheme, welfare scheme. I think they had at one stage. They had uh, a measure uh, previously. Um, yes, that, that's right. Um, okay, welfare scheme. And they had it was a scheme linked to the sort of genomics. Uh, it was previously nationally funded. Uh, but it's now part of the rural development uh, program, but it is very much linked to uh, that genomics uh, program. Uh, so it's not just a straightforward heritage payment uh, uh, yeah. to the provision of data and the use of genomics uh, on the on the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Just to emphasise, it's a pillar two rural development payment is made under that program. This consultation is about pillar one couple support. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Edwin. So it's politically motivated. Pardon? Was politically motivated? Um, sorry, the consultations. And, uh, what we're consulting on? Uh, no, these, I mean, these were commitments that were uh, agreed by the executive uh, back uh, 26th of June uh, 2014. 14. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the executive agreed to uh, a two-year uh, ANC measure uh, and agreed that it wouldn't be it would be looked at uh, after two years. The options that we're presenting cover uh, all of the possibilities. How does it how does it align with going for growth? How does a proposal like this align with going for growth? Uh, going for growth uh, didn't say anything about uh, ANC support. Uh, going, going for growth. Didn't, but uh, how does it align with going for Agri growth? Food strategy board did support um, coupled support uh, within the uh, the beef sector. <coughs> Um, but again, we, we need to be very clear uh, in terms of uh, the rationale for any such couple support. Uh, the, um, the regulation is clear that couple support is there to maintain uh, sectors that are under threat uh, and where the sectors are important for social, economic or environmental reasons. It's not a mechanism to drive growth. Hmm. And in terms of this, you've just done, we've just got the, the economic statistics in for uh, last year for for agriculture and it's demonstrating that in terms of the incomes, yeah, uh, 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 in incomes are poor. Yeah, is lowland farming, for example, the the the, the non ANC areas, is is it bucking the trend and it, it doing extremely well under current circumstances? Um, no. Um, if you looked uh, at the income figures, which uh, by farm sector. Um, so I recall, uh, dairy overall was was down uh, seventy eight percent. The lowland, lowland cattle and sheep uh, were not <coughs> down by as much. Uh, we can certainly uh, provide you with the figures. Mm -hmm. um, and um, hill farming or LFA farming sheep uh, also suffered a decline, but not as much as as dairy. Okay. Um, <coughs> now I would say, uh, and come back to the earlier point about uh, going for growth. Um, ANC support and Pillar 1 support uh, are income support measures. They're not production support measures. They're not linked to production, mm -hmm. and they cannot be linked to production. Yeah. Well, you know, 
even from the answers you've just given me there, the, 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 far, the, the agriculture that is facing the most stress is already losing out as a result of the decision to move from a production-based method of payment to a land-based method of payment. And now we're having a further proposal to enhance those who have large tracts of land, which is not as obviously not as valuable land in terms of its production uh, quality, but nonetheless those who are actually engaged in the extensive production, which is keeping the factories open, the meat plants, and the dairy processing sectors, and all of that there, they are the ones that's expected to take the hit if this consultation was accepted. The consultation provides all options. All options uh, are on the table, uh, but in terms of the nature of support, uh, we moved away from production support in 2005, uh, and we have been on area-based support since 2005. That doesn't mean it's right. Uh, the EU is pushing us towards that too. I just think it's a load of nonsense, to be honest, with a, a growing population right across the world. Um, uh, we should be supporting efficient agriculture uh, as opposed to, you know, Throwing money, I, I know people who have bought hill, hill, hill farms just because they're going to get money for a rope. You know, I think, the, yes, certainly. It takes very little farming, far, far, farming for it, but but uh, they're going to get very very large payments. Whenever you have a two thousand acre hill farm, for example, that's 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 a huge payment for very little production. Well, I think Yet with people who are actually totally committed to farming, whose sons and daughters are totally committed to farming, who are coming home to do it. They're struggling to make ends meet, and you know we'll have an expectation that we'll take more money away from that sector and give it to the people who are actually aren't doing that much productive farming. Yeah, well, I think everybody can sign up to uh, the, the idea of efficiency uh, in production uh, right across the system. Uh, efficiency in production is fairly well independent of where you farm. You can have efficient hill farmers, you can have efficient lowland farmers, and I think it's also. Uh, we shouldn't fall into the idea of thinking that nothing much happens within the SDA. Um, if you actually look within the consultation documents, I think we do quote figures for the, the extent of uh, livestock uh, production uh, within uh, those areas. Uh, for example, um, oh, uh, I think it's, it's about 40 odd percent of our suckler cows are located within the SDA. Yeah. A significant proportion uh, of our, our sheep, even some of our dairy herds, are located within the SDA. So uh, I don't think we, we, we want to get into uh, a debate about uh, you know which is the more efficient or not efficient. Well, there's, Efficiency there's, is around how you use the assets at your disposal. Uh, I don't disagree with that. And you have efficient farmers within the SDAs, and that's that goes without saying. The problems that those farmers face <coughs> is that they will not be, be cutting grass, for example, at the start of May, generally, because they live in a colder climate, and upland climate generally tends to be colder. Um, so they do not have the same quality of grass, and therefore it's difficult to have you know, the, the milk production output, for example, for, or, or, or indeed um, the live weight gain for, for cattle, um, because their silage quality isn't as good. And that's why it is more suitable for, for cows than it is for, for, for beef and so forth. But you know the max the the, far, the farms which will have the greatest levels of efficiency are generally not SDA. Well, in terms of land productivity, yes. yeah, that, that, that's. And that's nothing to do with the farmers. That's to do with the land. It's to do with the land, yeah. yeah. Um, but I suppose going back to the, the fundamental uh, but principle of, of cap. We're talking about uh, taking it's, it's, money from pillar, pillar one and moving to pillar two, and that's that's where I would have an issue. Well, that's only one of the options. Yeah. Um, I mean, to say all options are on the table. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Okay. So, Roger. <coughs> Thank you for your presentation earlier. Can you talk about new schemes and um, new boundaries and designation and fine tuning? Is it safe to say that any future AMC will be smaller? Uh, the, the maps that uh, we have presented, uh, yes, uh, the, the ANC area uh, is uh, smaller than the current uh, SDA. Uh, also, it's, it's not obviously perfectly aligned with the current uh, SDA, um, so it, it has to follow the administrative boundaries. Uh, so it is, it is slightly different. So I mean, the purpose is, is not to <coughs> recreate uh, the SDA. The purpose is to, um, as, as best as possible, 
uh, create a, a map uh, that is produced on a consistent basis uh, with every other region in, in Europe uh, as a means of trying to define where the, uh, the area, areas of physical disadvantage actually exist. Would it take into consideration, like, you know, land that is, within recent years has been flo flooded, you know? Uh, the, the biophysical uh, designation process looks at uh, soils, it looks at climate, uh, and looks at slope, um, and so uh, looks at things like soil moisture deficits and uh, stoniness, um, uh, heat uh, levels. So there's various biophysical uh, aspects. So it wouldn't look at uh, flooding uh, per se, but it looks at the, the soil. Uh, yeah, but say for example, over a long period of time. You know, Say physical factors and so on that that, that land re remained to be flooded for two or three months of the year. I think what you probably find uh, <coughs> is that that type of land has particular soil characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not the fact that it's flooding per se. It's it's the interaction of the soil uh, and uh, rainfall levels um, and, and and temperature as well is brought into play. Uh, so there might be a, a very strong correlation uh, between yeah, the two, but yeah. it's not because it floods per se. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think there, there, are, there have been concerns among the, the uh, and uh, Mr. Preach is probably certainly right on that. And there have been concerns among lowland farms, where the vast majority of food is produced uh, in relation to uh, our agri-food sector. I mean. Uh, certainly, they will be. Uh, their payments will be reduced drastically as we go to flat rate, mm -hmm. uh, and when others that, uh, on the face of it, produce <coughs> in some cases very very little, will receive massively more payments. But at, at, we, I understand that that's not a decision taken by Northern Ireland. It's, 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 Europe has imp imposed uh, this and and uh, a flat rate payment, but. I think we need to be quite careful uh, as uh, on the way forward. I do think uh, suckler cows, um, certainly, I, I hear it every day from suckler cow men, uh, if there's no couple payment, we'll not stand at this. You know, it's, it's very, very difficult for them, I think, uh, in the future, if there's no couple payment. But I, uh, I, and I certainly have some sympathies with their position. Mm -hmm. uh, any other members uh, have any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. to agenda item 9 for written brief of Pandora at ASR 2015 uh, 15 the areas of natural constraint regulations in Northern Ireland 2016 and advise members that Rosemary Fullerton will remain in the public gallery to answer really any sorry. questions. Okay. I knew my fault. Oh, knew, sorry. I have the wrong name wrote down so I read out what I've got. I have the wrong name wrote <laughs> <laughs> down. Um, and the public gallery to, to answer any questions that members may have in relation to this uh, on, uh, on this agenda item. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 238 and 239 and papers provided by the department at pages 240 to 52. Can I advise members that these regulations last came before the committee at the SL1 stage on the 12th of February 2016. The committee agreed that it was content with the merits of the policy and that it should move to the next legislative stage. Members may be aware that the areas of nat natural constraint scheme is designed to support those who farm in naturally disadvantaged areas in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. The ANC scheme succeeds the less favoured areas comp compensate realigned scheme, which operated under RDP 2007-2013. These regulations provide a domestic legal framework for the implementation of Ar Article 31 of Regulation 1305 13 and the payment of an ANC allowance. They also set out the terms of eligibility for an ANC allowance on the rate uh, that it is to be paid. No issues or concerns have been identified by the examiner of statutory rules. Can I seek comments from members? Okay, members, there are no comments. Can I put the question that the Committee for Agriculture and Rural Development has considered ASR 2016 or/15? The area, areas of natural constraint regulations in Northern Ireland 2016 has no exactly objection to the rule. Okay, members. Okay. <coughs> 
In item 10, written briefing SL1, agriculture student fees amendment regulations. Can I refer members to the memo from the clerk at pages 254 to 255 and papers to, provided by the department at pages 256 to 273. Can I advise members that these regulations propose the following increase in tuition fees for agriculture, for agriculture students. Annual basic tuition fee to be increased from £1,510 to £1,555 and the reduced duration fee to be increased from £740 to £760. These increases of 2.98% and 2.7% by the order mirror the legislative amount set by the Department of Employment and Learning Student Fees amounts amendment regulations Northern Ireland 2013, which also comes into operation on the 1st of September 2016. The committee has considered this issue for the past for the last four years and agreed the annual fee increase for those years. The rule will be laid before the Assembly under the negative resolution procedure and it is anticipated that it will come into operation on the 1st of September 2016. Can I seek any comments from members? Can I seek agreement that the SL1 moves to the next legislative stage? Reading briefing from DARD SR 2016. Or slash 22, the Bobile Barrel Dar Rear Eradication Scheme Order, Northern Ireland 2016. And for members to the memo from the clerk at pages 275 to 276. And papers provided by the department at pages 277 to 285. Can I advise members that these regulations last came before the committee at SL1 stage on the 8th of December 2015? The committee agreed that it was content with the merits of the policy and that it should move to the next legislative stage. Members may be aware that these regulations introduce compulsory testing for bovine viral diarrhoea, BVD, virus in newborn calves, including stillbirths and abortions. The order places legal requirement on the herd keeper to tag and test all newborn calves born after the 1st of March 2016 for BVD, the te to test all aborted bovine food fetuses, stillborn bovine calves or bovine calves that have died before being tagged, to carry out repeat analysis, uh, an analysis following initial uh, positive test result, should the herd keeper wish to have one taken, or if there is an in inconclusive result, non tested or test positives will not be allowed to move from herd other than to slaughter or rendering. <coughs> non tested dams of infected newborn cows <coughs> will also ha have to have a movement restriction placed on them. And Post imported bovines born after the 1st of March 2016 are required to be tested. Can I seek comments from members? If content, I'll put the question. The Committee for Agriculture and Rural Development has considered the SR 2016 or 22 bovine diarrhea eradication scheme order Northern Ireland 2016 and subject to comment. From the examiner of statutory rules has no objections to the rule. Great. Great. <coughs> Item 12 correspondence. Can I refer members to the correspondence received at pages 289 to 336? Can I draw your attention to the correspondence from Mr. Moriam at page 336? Mr. Moriam is seeking a meeting with the committee. Over the matter he wishes to discuss is part of an ongoing judicial review. Committee staff have spoken to Dodge staff and the judge has not indicated when he might make a judgment in this matter. Therefore, as per standing order 73, this matter falls under the sub judicial rule. The committee are therefore advised not to meet with Mr. Murray. Okay. Great. Okay. However, if there is a, uh, if there's any interest, I can s seek a brief factual written update on the matter. Can I seek agreement uh, to not? Are you already agreed to meet with Mr. Moran and to seek the factual update? Um, at the end of the day, we have no. This is uh, judicial with the judge, so we we uh, no matter what we are viewing, this doesn't really matter. So there's no much point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Raising dispute. So, common land or land held in trust, one of those funny things. It's within the court's now, so I think. Yep. Oh, my choice. 
No, no, we can't read it. Is that nothing held back? Is that, we, we, unless he withdraws us from court, yeah, we, we can't get involved in it. Yeah. And the courts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the courts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Do we seek an update? Is there an you'll update you're talking about? Is that from Mr. Murray or do we bother? There's no interest in everyone bothering. I wouldn't bother, I'd like to. Okay. I'll be able to arrange that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I take agreement to action, action the rest of the correspondences, correspondences suggested on the index sheet of pages 287 to 288? Agenda 13, Forward Work Programme. I refer members to the Forward Work Programme on pages 338 to 343. Can I take agreement for the Forward Work Programme, members? Good. Okay. Also advise members that the committee will visit to view the floodgates of tomb. It will take place this Thursday, 18th of February. At 2 p.m., is that right? Mm -hmm. I can refer members also to the draft PR for the visit on pages 344 to 345. Our uh, members can attempt to approve the press release. Okay. Number 14. Uh, uh, any other business, members? No other business? We all agenda item 15. Date and time of the next meeting. The next meeting of the committee of Ankle and Rural Development will take place on Thursday, or Tuesday, the 20th of February, 2016, at 1 30 pm, in room 30, Parliament Building. I declare the meeting adjourned. Assembly, committee room 30.